What will it take to finally get out of the nightmare of white supremacy and patriarchy? We keep having movements and conversations and wins to varying degrees. But every time we fix one of the symptoms of the problem, the problem transforms and reasserts itself and the system never changes. And the cycle continues. So, as two women who have each spent over a decade trying to break up the good old white boys club, in our case in media and entertainment, we keep asking ourselves, what will it take as a society to get out of the nightmare of white supremacy and patriarchy? In late 2017, in the wake of Me Too, when women finally had the world's attention, I thought I had part of the answer. I set out to create an organization of leaders working towards parity in Hollywood. The plan was that we could come together, train our laser beams at the white men in power, and change the system forever. I had charts and diagrams illustrating how we could avoid hierarchy. When Naomi called me to join, I had learned by then that predominantly white-led organizations would be hard to navigate as a black woman. I didn't want the responsibility of educating. But I said yes anyway because I was curious in learning what a community without a hierarchy could actually look like. At the first meeting of this new organization, I invited the assembled leaders to talk about what our dreams really were for the future of Hollywood. But we were so entrenched in the obstacles we were facing that we couldn't, our minds couldn't actually imagine anything else. And the problems didn't stop there. In our organization, formed to dismantle the existing system, we quickly adopted behaviors of our oppressors and used them against each other. Many of us began fighting for power when what we had said we wanted no hierarchy. Some women were oppressing other women. Other women were invested in protecting the white dudes in power. Every conversation seemed to be a battle over how to achieve intersectionality. And it became clear that we were just creating yet another power-driven system that was not equitable for all. So, after about a year of this, I call Naomi and I say, this isn't working. And I said, I know. Then we started talking. And we kept talking for weeks. Which turned into months. And eventually nearly two years of digging, discussing, researching. We, we created more Google Docs than I care to talk about in polite company. Asking ourselves, what went wrong? Why aren't our outcomes aligning with our intentions? So what we definitely know is that the system has institutionalized inequities and will, will continue to unless we change it. But also, what is happening inside of ourselves that is preventing those of us who consciously want change from just coming together, rising up, and making that change occur? Is it possible that, even when we think what we want is change, that our conditioning is leading us to participate in upholding the existing power structures? I'm going to repeat that for you. Is it possible then that even when what we think we want is change, that our conditioning is leading us to participate in upholding the existing power structures? That's deep. After all that digging, the devastating conclusion we arrived at was yes, because we are all shaped by this society. A society that in millions of subtle and not so subtle ways trains our brains from childhood to understand that the white, straight, cis, able-bodied man is the standard and the modes in which he operates are the norm. Which leaves many of us believing that the closer we twist ourselves to be just like him and near him, and the more we separate ourselves from those who look least like him, the more power, safety, money, resources, visibility, validation, that we will have. And so the next question is, how does that change? How do those of us who consciously want a different world actually liberate our minds enough to build it? That's a big question. That's a huge question. That we don't have the answers to. I'm sorry. But after all of this digging and researching and questioning, we do have some ideas. These ideas formed as Sarah and I listened to each other's stories, unpacking and understanding everything that had been programmed into each one of us. And what we realized was pretty surprising. That as different as our backgrounds and experiences have been, 
For me, growing up in Bakersfield, California, where I was called the N-word at five, and KKK rallies were common. Growing up in a liberal, supportive, very white community in Colorado where I was eight years old before I saw a black person in real life. Our journeys through wanting to become agents of change and trying to break free of the white supremacist, patriarchal teachings of the culture actually shared a lot of the same markers. Five markers, in fact. Five stages of growth that on our very, very different journeys, we have nevertheless each wrestled through. Over and over as we each try to heal ourselves and decolonize our minds. So if anything we're saying resonates with you, we'd like to offer those stages. And not because they're definitive or contain all of the answers. We are on this journey too. But because maybe as you travel your own journey, trying to unravel and heal all of this in yourself, that maybe when you arrive at these stages, you'll be able to say, Oh yeah, Sarah and Naomi told me this would happen. And that hopefully we take some of the terror that has been placed on anything related to dismantling race and gender out of it. And replace it with a shared human journey toward a better future. So, let's get into it. Growth stage one. Accept the full scope of the problem. We assume that if you're still listening to this talk, you're probably not one of those people on Twitter that we have to convince that white supremacy and patriarchy exist. But just to make sure we're all on the same page here. White men are roughly 30% of the US population. Now, if you get it down to white, straight, cis, able-bodied, and take into account non-binary folk who aren't even accounted for here, it's, it's less than that. But just for argument's sake, let's say 30%. That means that the rest of us are 70% of the population. And yet, when you look at who controls the resources, the institutions, the most powerful industries. Indeed, so total has the dominance of the white man been that he has reshaped almost everything in his own image. Just as a starter list, we are talking language, history, anthropology, religion, medicine, science, how we see ourselves, how we treat each other, and certainly the narratives we share and consume. We could go on, but in the spirit of trying to understand and accept the full scope of the problem, let's think about it this way. Imagine that the white supremacist patriarchy has wrapped your head in hundreds and hundreds of layers of gauze. Okay, so that you cannot see anything else, no light, just that white gauze. And every time something happens that forces you to see the system for what it is, you're peeling away a layer, whether it's an event, something that happens to you, a book you read, a conversation, you're peeling away yet another layer of that gauze. But you can't stop when you see your first glimmer of light, right? That's not the full scope of the problem. That's just like, oh my God, there's a problem. If you are interested in truly breaking free, you have to keep going. Always peeling, digging, educating yourself, deepening your understanding. Keeping in mind that the closer you are personally to that white male standard, the more proactive you will need to be in peeling away those layers, because the less likely it is that experience alone will do it for you. Yes, the only way out is to keep peeling away more and more layers of that gauze because believe us, you don't wanna spend the rest of your life with gauze over your eyes. Growth stage two, face your place in the system. So as we are continually understanding the scope of the problem, peeling away those layers, we must also look inward. We can't separate ourselves from the larger whole because we are the stuff of which that system is made. If my goal is to transform the system, I have to ask myself, in what ways am I too participating in upholding the existing system? I am white and a woman. I have been hurt, held back, and discriminated against because of my gender. And also, I have benefited from my whiteness, and I have participated in maintaining that standard. And I am black and a woman a member of two of the most marginalized groups in the world, but that doesn't mean that I haven't benefited from the opportunities not always awarded to the most marginalized among us, especially black queer and transgendered women who are far too often neglected and overlooked. And if we've participated in upholding this system, it's kind of likely you have too. 
in microaggressions and or overt racist and sexist behavior. In believing the myths about scarcity, the fear that somehow there isn't enough for all of us. In reacting out of that fear to fight with each other for position and power. In justifying inhumane behavior. Because hey, after all, it's just business, right? In valuing the accumulation of wealth and status over well-being. In internalized sexism and racism and colorism. Giving in to the training that our voices don't matter. Making ourselves smaller to validate the lie that their vision matters more. And turning that self-hatred on each other. Because the genius thing of white supremacy and patriarchy is that it can exist with or without pri the primary beneficiaries being present. Now as you look at this, you may feel fears or tensions flare up in your body. The abyss opening up. Defensiveness, rejection, shame, guilt. All of those bad feelings that we work so hard to avoid. But like with any feelings, the more you avoid them, the more they grow up inside you, the more power they gain. So turn around and face them. With the same ongoing rigor with which you tear that gauze away from your eyes, you must also continually interrogate your own beliefs, values, and ideas. Always questioning the source. Where does this come from? If you truly want something new, you have to be willing to risk and let go of every facet of the old. Values around money and history, culture, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. If you truly want something new, you have to be willing to do the work of becoming your own human being. What we're asking is hard. And it's going to bring grief. Growth stage three, grieve and release. I grieve. A torturous feeling of having to break apart and destroy the toxicity that remained in my mind about the times I failed to show up for myself and for my community. About how I bought into lies and narratives designed to limit and hurt me. I've been angry, angry at the system, yes, but even angrier at myself. The years of my life that I fell into this trap, growing up wanting straight hair or fair skin so that I could be accepted or more desirable to survive, while trying to live up to a standard that was never my own. There is a grief I spent decades avoiding. The grief of looking directly at the fact that every moment of my entire life has been easier because I am white. I and people who look like me have gone to unspeakable lengths to avoid that simple truth. I have wept for that too. Tears that are infinitesimal in scale in comparison to the suffering caused by our avoidance. I have grieved to stop avoiding, grieved to my own oppression, anger and indignation at the lies I was told as a child on repeat that women can do anything, reach for the stars, girl power, without ever having anyone explain to me why those things were necessary to say in the first place. We're not just healing our own pain. We are also healing the trauma of generations. Centuries of trauma inflicted by white supremacy and patriarchy. As Octavia Butler said, in order to rise from its own ashes, a phoenix first must burn. So burn. Release. Let it go. Growth stage four, heal. Don't worry, we're not gonna leave you there on your knees. Alongside the grief in order to heal our society, we must find a way to heal ourselves. How you go about finding that healing will be deeply personal. I have found healing in meditation. I in kundalini yoga and reiki. In the ugly cries. In therapy. In spirituality and creativity. In community and ritual. You're going to have to discover where that healing can happen for you based on who you are and where you, what you have access to. Ensuring access to healing practices for all is going to be required for our collective recovery. Like with all of this, there are no one and done quick fixes. But... The good news is, we know human transformation is possible. If you've ever broken a habit or healed from a trauma of any kind, this work is really not so different from that work. And the exciting part is, as you heal, you get to put yourself back together. Accepting and integrating a new, probably messier understanding of yourself. But this time with the integrity of truth and love. Growth stage five. Build a different dream. 
Now, what we are definitely not saying is that you must cease all external action for change until you go into a cave, fix yourself, and come out pure and ready to do the work. The external systems that institutionalize oppression are real, and we must be impatient in our demands for them to change. What we are saying is that you cannot neglect the internal work and only focus on the external work. Yes, because they are connected. Which means that as you continue your journey of accepting the scope of the problem, facing your place in that problem, grieving and healing, you're going to have to simultaneously continue taking actions to dismantle the system that exists. A system that will inevitably push back. It's going to be messy. This is an ongoing practice and we are going to oscillate. You can't take it on all at once. Like healing any deep wound, you're going to have to tend to it every day and you're gonna get it wrong sometimes. Remember to extend forgiveness to yourself. And hey, have some forgiveness and compassion for others on their journeys too. We are attempting a mass transformation of human consciousness. We are never all gonna be in the same stage of that transformation at the same time. But the other good news is, this current reality, these current systems started somewhere. Humans began them. We were taught them which means we can unlearn them and we can change our reality. In fact, we don't even need everyone to get there. According to Erica Chenoweth's research, you only need about 3.5% of a population to activate and dismantle a system. So come be a part of that 3.5%. We're not saying it's gonna be easy. We feel overwhelmed a lot. But from our own process, we can honestly say that it can be joyful also. I've had a really good time doing this work with you. Same, I've learned so much. We've learned a lot and we've laughed a lot. And looking back, we've realized that that organization we formed back in 2017 may have actually been a success. It forced us into conflict, which forced us into growth. And growth is actually the whole point. In fact, it is only through growth that we will finally wake up from this nightmare that has always been someone else's dream. Yes, and finally begin to build our own.